We are back with another viewer question. This is a good one. A viewer asks, did Judas go to hell? I recently heard a pastor say in the middle of his sermon, there's no way God would send Judas to hell since he was actually a part of God's will for Jesus to be crucified and so that scripture would be fulfilled. This is a great question. And before we jump into the answer, if you have questions that you would like us to tackle here at Disciple Dojo, feel free to watch the video linked in the description below on how to submit your questions so that I will actually see it. If you leave a question in the comment sections or on social media, I don't always see those but you can submit them through our website. It's quick, it's easy, it's painless, and it's free. Just like all Disciple Dojo resources and teaching material. And we can only do that because of our generous monthly dojo donors. So if you find this ministry helpful and you would like to become a dojo donor, it could be a dollar a month, it could be a million dollars a month. But for most people, it'll probably be somewhere in between those two numbers. Regardless of what you're able to give, if you want to support us, that is the biggest way you can tangibly keep this ministry going. And even if you can't give financially, one thing you can do that is completely free and helps us tremendously is to subscribe and to click the notifications icon. You would not believe how much that helps a YouTube-based ministry. Okay, so speaking of ministry, let's get into it. So everybody just takes it for granted that Judas went to hell. I mean, if anybody is in hell, it should be the close friend of his who betrayed him to his death and then went and killed himself afterwards. In fact, in Dante's Inferno, one of the most influential works uh, dealing with the subject of hell in the entire Western canon, Judas is one of the worst sinners at the lowest circle of hell. So there's a long tradition of the idea that Judas is in hell. But as our questioner asked, there's also a number of passages that say Judas's betrayal of Jesus was preordained by God. It was part of God's plan. It fulfilled scripture. So in that sense, I mean, Judas, didn't he do the greatest thing ever? If Judas hadn't betrayed Jesus, there wouldn't be a crucifixion. If there wasn't a crucifixion, there wouldn't be a resurrection. If there wasn't a resurrection, there wouldn't be salvation, and we would all be dead in sin. So really, Judas is the hero, right? This is a line that some people have put forward. As we do in these Q&A videos, let's try to look at some of the scriptural background and see what we can and what we can't say about all this. Now, the idea that Judas is among the damned comes from a number of scriptures, one of which is John chapter 17 in Jesus's high priestly prayer. He prays that all of his followers may be one, that they may be protected by the power of God's name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. The high priestly prayer of Jesus is what this passage is called. And so in verse 12, Jesus says, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Now, in the King James, what the NIV has rendered here, the one doomed to destruction, it's this Greek phrase down here, hahuias teis apeleas, literally the son of destruction or in Latin, the son of, it used the word perditio, and that's where you get the phrase, the son of perdition, which is how the King James reads. But this word, apoleos, means destruction or ruin. So for most interpreters, this is referring to Judas. Judas is the chiastes apoleos, the son of perdition, son of ruin, son of destruction. That's one piece of evidence that argues strongly that Judas's fate ultimately is the opposite of everlasting life. It is destruction. Another passage comes in Mark chapter 14, and the parallel in Matthew is worded pretty much exactly the same. But when they're asking who will betray Jesus, he says, it's one of the 12, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. In verse 21, the son of man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. And this is again, talking about Judas. So son of perdition or one doomed to destruction, it would be better if he had not been born. And then lastly, in Acts chapter one, when the apostles are gathering and they're choosing a successor for Judas, verse 24, then they pray, the Lord, you know, everyone's heart, show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left 
to go where he belongs. And in Greek, this is literally eis ton tapan ton idion, to go to his own place, or we would say to go to the place where he belongs. So these three scriptures argue very strongly that Judas's fate was one of ultimate destruction. Now, it is worth noting that none of those passages specifically and explicitly say that Judas went to hell or that Judas's eternal fate is hell. Scripture doesn't explicitly state that, but those passages would seem to argue that if there is a final separation from God and everlasting destruction as opposed to everlasting life in the kingdom, you would have to make a pretty compelling case that Judas would be in the latter rather than the former. However, it is worth noting that there has been question about this. There's been speculation going all the way back to the early church. You see this, for example, in the writings of the church father Origen. In Against Celsus, book two, chapter 12, he has a discussion about Judas and his fate and what was going on in his mind and even the sorrow and the repentance that he felt afterwards. And Origen suggests those proofs which show that the apostasy of Judas was not a complete apostasy, even after his attempts against his master. However, that's definitely a minority opinion if that is in fact what Origen was arguing. And I, I'm not a, a patristic scholar. I don't know if Origen was being rhetorical, if he was just saying for the sake of the argument, let's say that this is the case. So it's just worth pointing out that the text comes right up to the edge of saying Judas is eternally damned for all time, but it never explicitly states that. However, the text does talk about, especially in John's gospel, Judas being motivated by Satan entering him and Judas handing Jesus over and Judas doing what was in his heart to do. So there's this confluence of factors in scripture. Judas acted according to God's foreordained plan. Judas acted according to his own desires and out of his own greed. And Judas acted under the influence of Satan himself to destroy the son of God. And we just have to hold those things in tension somehow. I like how the Lexham Bible Dictionary puts it in the article on Judas, and they say the gospel writers are comfortable with the theological complexity of their accounts. They appear to uphold God's will, Satan's evil influence, and Judas's human responsibility simultaneously in their presentations of Judas's act of betrayal. And similarly, in the New Bible Dictionary, Ralph Martin's article about Judas kind of sums up all of the ways that Christians have approached the theological questions that these factors that all come to bear on Judas's actions bring up theologically. And Martin says that there are three guiding principles that we need to keep in mind. One, we ought not to doubt the sincerity of the Lord's call. Jesus, at the beginning, viewed him as a potential follower and disciple. No other presupposition does justice to the Lord's character and his repeated appeals to Judas. I mean, Jesus legitimately called Judas, and Judas was actually one of his friends and followers, and Jesus loved Judas. But the second principle, the Lord's foreknowledge of him does not imply foreordination that Judas must inexorably become the traitor. In other words, it's not necessary that just because God knows that something is inevitably going to happen, that that thing doesn't happen because of the free choice of an individual. Some people assume that to be the case, but that's an assumption that doesn't logically follow. And this gets into the complexity of determinism and free will versus foreordination. And that's bigger than this video can really unpack because it kind of comes down to the heart of the whole Calvinist versus Arminian divide. But it's just worth noting that that's not a package deal. God for knowing something is not the same as God making that thing happen with no responsibility on the part of the one upon whom God is acting. And then the third principle, Judas was never really Christ's man. He fell from apostleship, but never, so far as we can tell, had a genuine relationship to the Lord Jesus. So he remained the son of perdition who was lost because he was never saved. His highest title for Christ was rabbi, which he says in Matthew 26, 25, never Lord. He lives on the stage of scripture as an awful warning to the uncommitted follower of Jesus who is in his company 
but does not share his spirit. He leaves the gospel story a doomed and damned man because he chose it so, and God confirmed him in that dreadful choice. And so Martin depicts Judas as something like when Jesus says, on that day, I'll say, away from me, I never knew you, to the very people who claim, Lord, didn't we do all this in your name? I mean, Judas cast out demons in Jesus's name. Judas healed people in Jesus's name. He was among the disciples during the ministry when Jesus was sending them out, and they were doing all these things. And yet we know from Jesus's own words that on that day, there will be those who are going to be surprised because they did those things in Jesus's name. So Martin makes the case that Judas is an example of one such person. But again, not every interpreter takes that approach. Some read Judas with a more sympathetic understanding. An example of that would be William Classen in the Yale Anchor Bible Dictionary. In his article on Judas, he notes this mystery and says, In no other person do the elements of free will and divine providence come together so ambiguously. Whoever we believe about Judas and his eternal fate, we have to realize that, yes, there is an element of ambiguity in how it all unfolded. What part was God's will? What part was Satan's influence? What part was Judas's own character? Or was it all of those simultaneously in some way that we just can't fully put into words? And Klassen says, no doubt this is the reason why Judas has held such a compelling attraction for theologians and artists over the centuries and does even now. But Klassen ends his article by saying, is it too much to suggest that whatever Judas did, he too was covered by the intercessory prayer of Jesus from the cross? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So Clausen doesn't push that that was the case with Judas, but he also wants to raise the question that even Judas is never said to be completely outside the grace of God. And ultimately, we don't know his fate. So wherever you land on the question of, of Judas, the individual, whether he is doomed to hell for all time, or whether there is a chance that at some point, maybe as he's hanging from that tree that he hung himself in his shame, in his brokenness, after having betrayed his friend, maybe there's a chance that in some way, he had a thief on the cross moment in those time between when he actually hung himself and when he died and his body dropped and burst open in the field. There are just some unknowns. Scripture makes a heavy case that Judas's ultimate fate was destruction. We do not get any sense from the text itself that he ever repented. We do get a sense that he felt bad about what he did, but that's not the same as repentance. So we just have to acknowledge that it seems that given the information we have, the outcome for Judas doesn't look good. And yet we need to make sure that we give it the weight that it deserves, that whenever Jesus talked about who will and will not inherit the kingdom, one of the main themes that runs through all of his teachings on that is that on that day, there are going to be a lot of surprises. So is Judas in hell? Short answer, I don't know. Do you have good reason to think that he died in unrepentance? It would seem that way based on how he's described. But ultimately, I have to leave that up to the only one who can judge. And that's his friend and his rabbi, Jesus. But that pushes us into the second part of the question, which is the person who asked, they said their pastor said, there's no way Judas can be in hell because what he did was part of God's plan. Is that correct? No, that does not follow. Just because God uses someone to accomplish his will, that does not exonerate that person and the evil that they choose to do. God raised up Pharaoh and hardened his heart in order to display his glory over the gods of Egypt and to free his people. Scripture is clear about that. That does not mean that Pharaoh did not suffer the judgment that he deserved. Scripture is clear about that. Why would God harden his heart? Well, we have a whole video here on the channel devoted specifically to that question, and I'll link it in the video description below. But there are other examples in the Old Testament as well, and that's what I want to spend the next part of this video looking at so that you can get a feel for how the God of the Bible works when it comes to ordaining and using and decreeing judgment and macro level plans in world history and also punishing those, even those who he used to accomplish his plan for their own freely chosen 
guilt. We see this all over the place in the prophets. And I'm just going to point out a few examples that will help us wrap our minds around how this theme unfolds throughout scripture. In Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah is prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. That is imminent. It is unstoppable. It is unavoidable. It is going to happen. And Jeremiah is sent to tell Israel and to bear witness to their guilt and what is about to happen to them as a nation after centuries of them blatantly violating the terms of the covenant and committing wanton injustice and sinful wickedness. In Jeremiah 25, 8, Therefore the Lord Almighty says this, Because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north, and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones. These are everyday, joyous, healthy, normal signs of a functioning society and the light of the lamp. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. So in Jeremiah 25, it is clear that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians are the means by which God is going to bring judgment upon Israel and cast Israel out of the land. Two chapters later, chapter 27, God says, verse 5, With my great power and outstretched arm, I made the earth and its people and the animals that are on it, and I give it to anyone I please. Now I will give all your countries into the hands of my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I'll make even the wild animals subject to him. All nations will serve him and his son and his grandson until the time for his land comes. Then many nations and great kings will subjugate him. So God's making it clear. He's using Nebuchadnezzar as his tool of judgment. But that is not carte blanche that Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, by extension, will be held innocent of their evils. And that's what happens. And then when we get to Jeremiah chapter 50, look what we read. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty God of Israel says. I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I punished the king of Assyria. We'll talk about them in a minute. But I will bring Israel back to their own pasture. And then in the very next chapter... Chapter 51, verse 33, this is what the Lord Almighty God of Israel says. Daughter Babylon is like a threshing floor at the time it is trampled. The time to harvest her will soon come. Threshing floor is where you put the grain, the, the wheat and the chaff all together, and then animals come and drag a sled around it or stomp around it, and it is crushed. This is an image of a nation being utterly and completely crushed. Look at verse 34. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has devoured us. He has thrown us into confusion. He has made us an empty jar. Like a serpent, he has swallowed us and filled his stomach with our delicacies. And then he has spewed us out. These are the people that Nebuchadnezzar, whom God has allowed to come in and act as his method of judgment has utterly destroyed the voice of them crying out about this same Nebuchadnezzar's wickedness. Look at verse 35. May the violence done to our flesh be on Babylon, say the inhabitants of Zion. May our blood be on those who live in Babylonia, says Jerusalem. Verse 36. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. See, I will defend your cause and avenge you. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Babylon will be a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, an object of horror and scorn, a place where no one lives. So then there's a call for Israel to come out of Babylon. And then verse 47, for the time will surely come when I will punish the idols of Babylon. Her whole land will be disgraced. Her slain will lie fallen within her. Then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy 
over Babylon, for out of the north destroyers will attack her, declares the Lord. And this is what happened when Persia actually came and overthrew Babylon. And look at this, Babylon must fall because of Israel's slain, just as the slain in all the earth have fallen because of Babylon. So in Jeremiah, you see this paradox. God is using Babylon as his instrument of judgment against Israel, according to his word, going all the way back to Deuteronomy. God's plan is unfolding. However, that very same prophet is also unequivocally declaring that Babylon will be judged and avenged for the evils that Babylon commits. Because when Babylon was conquering these empires, there was no acknowledgement on their part that they were acting according to any god of some backwoods people over on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, this little nothing strip of land called Judah. They weren't acting according to any divine lofty plan. Babylon was doing what evil empires do, crushing and subjugating people. And so Babylon will be judged for doing what evil empires do. Yet at the same time, in some way that we can't fully explain, none of that happened apart from God's sovereign plan. And the key lesson to learn in this is in the world of the Hebrew scriptures, what people intend for evil, God intends for good. Going all the way back to the story of Joseph and his brothers in Egypt. That's a theme from beginning to end. So Judas could act according to the plan of God and not realize that's what he was doing and therefore not be exonerated because Judas was acting of his own twisted volition. Judas was being a traitor and yet... God's sovereignty is so great that even Judas's freely chosen evil is ultimately used for the greatest good in history. This is the paradox of God's sovereignty that we just have to hold to. And there are two more prophets that we'll look at, and their books are back to back in the minor prophets, the book of the 12, because they both are largely based around this entire concept. The first is the book of Nahum or Nahum. And Nahum is giving a prophecy concerning Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. They were the big bad evil empire before Babylon. They were who Babylon took over and then Persia took over after Babylon. So Nahum is prophesying against Nineveh. And in chapter 1, verse 14, he says, The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave for you are vile. Look there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. It goes on chapter 2, verse 7. It is decreed that Nineveh be exiled and carried away. That's what Nineveh had done to so many people before them. They had exiled and carried away people. Now they are experiencing the judgment for their own evil empire actions. And just as they had done, Nineveh is going to be plundered. Nineveh is going to be pillaged and stripped because, verse 13, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will burn up your chariots in smoke and the sword will devour your young lions. One of the symbols for Nineveh was the lion, one of the royal symbols of their strength and their might. I will leave you no prey on the earth and the voice of your messengers will no longer be heard. Now it's important to note this judgment is against Nineveh, but Nineveh was who God, through the earlier prophets, had promised he was going to bring against the northern kingdom of Israel. So if you read prophets like Hosea, you'll read about this coming destruction that's going to happen to the northern kingdom. And it's going to be through God using Nineveh. And yet here you have pretty much the whole book of Nahum is about Nineveh being judged for the evil that they committed. And Nahum ends his book with this verse, nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? So Nineveh, God's weapon of judgment against the evil of northern kingdom of Israel, is also then judged for their cruelty. These two concepts are not in conflict with one another in the Hebrew prophets. 
the very next book, we keep scrolling and we come to Habakkuk. And Habakkuk now is going to be told something that blows his mind. And look what God says to Habakkuk in chapter one. In general, it's one of those verses that will get pulled out of context and spoken over someone as if it's this blessing and this speaking into existence, naming and claiming some good blessing that God's about to do. And you'll hear preachers fire people up by talking about, look at the nations and watch, be utterly amazed for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. No. That's not what this verse is teaching. If somebody speaks this as a word over you, just remind them that the verse continues, that it doesn't stop there. Because look at this thing that's going to be so amazing. It's actually going to be amazing at how dreadful and seemingly wrong it is in the eyes of Habakkuk. Verse 6, the next verse, I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. Verse 7, they are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. This is the motive of Babylon right here. The Babylonian Empire was not doing God's plan out of any benevolence on their part. They were the epitome of might makes right, and all they cared about was their own honor. And down in verse 11, they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. And Habakkuk can't believe this. This makes no sense to him. He says, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You can't tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? God, how can you use wicked, evil people when you're a holy, righteous God? Habakkuk can't wrap his mind around this. And throughout the rest of the book, God never answers that question of Habakkuk. He simply says, this is what I'm going to do. And Habakkuk just has to say, okay, I don't know how to handle this, but I'm going to cling to my faith in God and just trust that it's going to work out somehow in the end. And God does make sure that Habakkuk knows that Babylon is not going to be held guiltless for this evil either. Chapter 2, verse 8, because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood, you have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. And down in verse 17, the violence you have done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you. God's even going to hold them accountable for their destruction of animals. And more than that, for you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. And Habakkuk never resolves this in his own mind. The book ends with him uttering a prayer of faith that somehow God's going to do right. Verse 17, though the fig tree doesn't bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. These are famine conditions. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Why? Because they've all been taken away by this empire that's destroyed their land. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord's my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. And that's it. That's how the book of Habakkuk ends. So what does this have to do with Judas? Well, it illustrates a point in biblical theology that just because God uses evil to accomplish his sovereign purposes doesn't mean that the evil he uses wasn't also freely chosen and the people that committed it weren't also guilty of evil and won't be judged. So to the viewer who submitted this question, if your pastor taught that because Judas's betrayal of Jesus was done according to God's plan, therefore we know that Judas is not in hell, that he actually was saved. No, your pastor seems unaware of basic biblical theology if that's what he or she has been teaching. Because one of the most foundational truths in all of Scripture, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 50, 
the evil people intend for harm, God actually intends for good to accomplish what he wants done, the saving of many lives. And the ultimate expression of this principle is the crucifixion, death, resurrection of Jesus. So just because God used it for good doesn't mean that it was not intended for evil. So hopefully this gives a little bit more of a foundation for how we approach issues of God's sovereignty and human freedom. Now, like I said earlier in the video, this does get into the whole determinism, free will, Calvinism, Arminianism, and whichever side of that divide you land on may color a little bit of how you approach the issue of predetermination versus guilt. But Calvinist Arminians both agree for the most part, that no, Judas was not held innocent just because God foreordained that his son would be betrayed and handed over. The Calvinist would say Judas acted out of his own sinful desires, and so therefore God was not the one doing it. Arminians would say Judas freely chose to do that, and if Judas had not freely chosen it, someone else would have. But in his sovereignty, God knew how it was all going to work out. God knew what Judas would freely choose to do. For more on that issue, check out these two videos we have here on the channel. One presenting what I think is a fair and an accurate representation of Calvinism. And from the feedback I've gotten from most Calvinist viewers who have seen it, they agree that it presents it accurately. And then the follow-up video where I present what I think is a better approach and why I myself am not in the Calvinist camp, even though I have tremendous respect for them and I do consider it an in-house issue where Christians can in good faith disagree. But at the end of the day, there will come a point where we have to say, I don't know how this all works out at the nuts and bolts level. I just know this is true and this is true. And I just have to hold these things together and acknowledge that I may not be able to see how exactly they fit together in every instance. But what do we always say here at Disciple Dojo? Hold the inessentials with loose hands. So thanks for watching. Again, if you have not already subscribed and you found this video helpful, we would appreciate it if you would subscribe. And I would very much appreciate it if you click the notifications icon because that pushes us up in the algorithms here at YouTube and it helps more people discover this channel who may not otherwise see it in their feed. So that's all for now. Thank you for watching. Continue to submit your questions. And as always, keep training.